I'm going to try this mic first. Is this coming through okay? Yeah. Okay, fine. I have to get fairly close to this gentleman if you use this mic. The formal title of this uh, program is Progressive or Oppressive? Maybe some of both. Balancing the History of Manifest Destiny, and two of our authors will be in a book signing afterwards. Um, the two that are up here, I believe, will be in a book signing at 4 p.m. And I'm Gary Alexander, your moderator, and I've been uh, with the Skousens in Freedom Fest from the beginning, and I've known them for 40 years, ever since we worked uh, at KCI, that's Kephart Communications, back in Alexandria, Virginia, 1979 and 80. Boy, we're getting old. <laughs> and I have helped the Skousens in these uh, panels and in the film festival, and in dramatizations. I played John Adams a couple of times up here in their dramatizations of 1776 and the debates of the Founding Fathers. That's been a lot of fun. So we're going to go back retrospectively in history a couple of centuries here to the concept of manifest destiny, two words that should be manifestly obvious what they mean. Uh, there was a belief back then that uh, it was America's destiny. It was manifest. It was obvious, in other words, that we would go from sea to shining sea, from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. It was destined that we would do that. And as a thought experiment, what would have happened if we'd only had the first 50-mile strip of the East Coast only settled that, and then only a few people like, uh, say, Jim Bridger, a few uh, fur traders would go into the uh, inland and trade peacefully one-on-one uh, -on -one with the natives and not take over their land, just to continue to uh, barter and exchange one-on-one -on -one in a peaceful manner and not take over the continent. What might have happened? What would have happened in that scenario? This is the debate that we are going to be here to discuss today. And it's not an exact uh, science of 100% oppressive, 100% progressive, and I imagine we'll come to a situation in which there's some of both, and you might lean toward one side or another, lean toward progressive or oppressive. And so if I were to take a poll of this audience right at the beginning, and I will take a poll at the end, how many think that Manifest Destiny was a progressive event? It bettered mankind and it worked out to the advantage of, of the growth of everything that's good. I'd say about half the audience. How many believe it was oppressive? No good. And I don't believe anybody raised their hands here. Did anybody raise their hand? Okay, Tom. Tom is going to be our first speaker, and he can take both sides because he has written from both sides. He's written about Wild Bill, and he had a roundtable discussion of Wild Bill at noon. Was anybody there for that Wild Bill discussion? Yeah? Thank you. And he also wrote about Dodge City, Wider, Bat Masterson, and the wildest, wickedest town in the West. And he's also written from the uh, point of view of Red Cloud, an American legend, the heart of everything that is. This is a man who fought the American army and won and retired undefeated and lived to his mid-80s, pretty miraculous feat. So he is going to take the positive side of the Native Americans uh, who withstood the manifest destiny as long as they could. He is going to take the side of oppressive today for our opening talk. Tom Clavin. Clavin? <laughs> Clavin is fine. Clavin is fine. From there or here, either one. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for being here, everybody, and thank you for the introduction. Sorry, I ran a little bit late, got caught in a conversation out there. Um, anyway, Manifest Destiny was a, you know, irrevocable, inevitable movement in this country. I don't subscribe to the idea that at any time in our history, anybody could have called a timeout, that they could have caused a pause, that they could have been a stop to Manifest Destiny. It was inevitable. It had to happen. Uh, and it's not just we're talking about the American West. I mean, it began, if you look back at Daniel Boone's time in the 1750s, 1760s, 1770s, when uh, there was actually the English Proclamation of 1763 forbade American colonists from going across the Appalachians and the Alleghenies and into the, uh, uh, what would become Kentucky and Tennessee and, and Ohio country and those states. And 
the, the idea was to keep that as Indian land, and we have to, you know, respect boundaries. Uh, that was pretty much ignored very quickly. Uh, treaties were signed to, to uh, 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 buy or, or trade for Indian land. And here were people were pouring through the Cumberland Gap. They were pouring through other uh, avenues to get. So the idea of Manifest Destiny did not begin on, in, the, in the prairie, in the plains. It was very much part of the origin of the United States of America during the Revolutionary War. And that, fr that frontier just kept moving west. You know, there would be a certain amount of settlement, and then there would be more explora exploration and settlement. Uh, what you started to have more and more as they moved west, the, the um, discovery of gold, silver, precious, precious metals. Okay, that was another reason why we needed to have that land. Uh, the, the Indians, the war with the Indians really lasted over a century. You could say even longer. Uh, but where it really sort of got to its climax is when we had that last swath of land, you know, west of the Mississippi to the, to the Rocky Mountains, and uh, that was really the last, uh, attempt, last frontier that was left to occupy. And the, uh, I don't subscribe also to the idea that the, the American Indian tribes were these innocent beings that, you know, just love the environment and peace and this Disney version of birds twittered around them and they were very peaceful. Uh, it was actually a very violent culture. Intertribal warfare was very brutal. Uh, what we talk about, and I'm in the heart of everything that is, it was sort of like uh, we compare it to, it was gang warfare on the plains with the tribes being gangs, and they were constantly fighting each other, not for land necessarily. That was a bit of a different concept. But for hunting grounds and for bragging rights, uh, they would steal ponies from each other, they would kidnap from each other. Uh, and then suddenly what started to happen is that this, this really big gang of the whites showed up. And because of the intertribal warfare that was going on, many of the tribes realized too late that the only chance they had was to join together to fight this common en enemy. The, 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 the sort of the last gasp of that was when uh, was what's called Red Cloud's War, 1866 to 68. Uh, Red Cloud was one of those very unusual uh, leaders of the Indians where he got tribes to work together against the common enemy. But even by that point, it was already too late uh, because even though he won, Red Cloud is the only Indian to win a war against the U.S. government where the U.S. government actually sued for peace. It was already too late by then. Uh, you know, we were talking and preparing for this that uh, there was an incident in 1870 after the war was over. Uh, the Grant administration made a very smart move um, Red Cloud had become kind of a celebrity, you know, the, the, Im the, the image of the uh, great war Indian warrior. And he had just come off this tremendous victory. They invited him to make a, a trip to the East Coast with his lieutenants, let's say, which he did in 1870. And he was first invited to Washington. President Grant personally hosted a reception in his honor. And then he, was, he, he came to New York City, and he rode up Broadway with thousands of people cheering him you know, from, the, from the sidewalks. But the most telling part of the trip was that while he was in Washington, D.C., they, they took Red Cloud on, on, on tours. And the most important one was they took him to see the U.S. Armory. And they took him to the Navy Yards. And they took him here and there. And they didn't have to say anything. And he was a smart man. He could see. He went back to South Dakota and went back to the Lakota Sioux. And he said, basically, he said, essentially, we're done. He should see the future. Um, you know, one very short, short comment he made, you white people make all the ammunition, is what he said. And he was being very, and he was, it, was, it, it sounds facetious, but what he meant was, there's no way we can compete with that. So I think Manifest Destiny was a great thing for the United States. It definitely was. It was a terrible thing for the Indians, but it's not like at any point it could have been undone. It was unfortunately very inevitable. Uh, now, before I go any further, I'm sure other people want to chime in on that. Um, our next speaker is not a historian as such, but is a historian of ideas. And yesterday he spoke about why socialism works. Anybody see that talk with, yeah, that was great. And, uh, and he had a wonderful chart about health and wealth and uh, considering 
the nations of the world and also considering over time the ideas of, of uh, capitalism uh, versus the socialism and other isms that don't work. Stephen Hicks is professor of philosophy at Rockford University. He's authored four books. I've just finished reading one of them explaining postmodernism, which I plan to give to my uh, children and their college age children, which are my grandchildren. It so clearly explicates what's wrong with the postmodernist uh, interpretations of history and uh, the world around us. So Stephen Hicks, your ideas on this subject. Thanks. Uh, my agenda as an intellectual historian with the philosophical background is always to use the history as uh, ammunition and as illumination on contemporary issues. Right? So the, the lessons of history, we want to learn them. So the question then is what is the lesson of history that we should learn from the manifest destiny theory and the actual history of, uh, of the U.S. And I'm, I'm going to argue that it was not inevitable. Obviously, uh, that's a very strong claim to make, but nothing in human history is inevitable. It's always a matter of choices. We can always say, given the probable factors that are at work, more, some things are more likely than others to occur, but manifest destiny does not rise to the level, even I think a very high, high probability. Uh, first though, what do we mean by manifest destiny? And it actually covers a pretty wide range of uh, understandings about the forces that are, that are operable. So I have a quotation here from John Quincy Adams. Uh, this is before the phrase manifest destiny is operable, but he's writing a letter to his father, John Adams. This is in 1911. Quote, the whole continent of North America appears to be destined by divine providence to be peopled by one nation speaking one language, professing one general system of religious and political principles, and accustomed to one general tenor of social usages and customs. For the common happiness of them all, for their peace of prosperity, I believe it is indispensable that they should be associated in one federal union. Now notice the, uh, the astonishing, right, from our 21st century perspective, scope of this kind of manifest destiny claim. And I think it should be clear in historical hindsight that that's not a very good prediction. Right? But it does capture some of the spirit philosophically and morally and religiously of one strong form of, uh, of manifest destiny. The second one is, uh, I believe actually Tom quotes it in his book. Um, you know, this is Red Cloud a little bit later. He's in Washington, D.C. And Red Cloud is uh, realizing that the Indians are essentially going to lose, uh, that there's no way for them to, uh, to assert any uh, sufficient power to maintain their traditional lifestyle in North America. So it's a, a huge game changer, the arrival of the Amer Americans. But he's, uh, in a sense, in using our language, playing a victim card, right? saying that uh, you Americans are, are big and bad and you shouldn't be doing this to us and we have the right to our land and our way of life and you should, uh, you should leave us alone. So at one point he makes a claim that his ancestors were buried in the hills and that's then to stake a certain kind of moral claim to, uh, to, to stop the spread of the Americans. And there's a U.S. officer who's in conversation with Red Cloud at this point, uh, replies to him and says, that's nonsense. And actually, what he said was, quote, horse shit. Right? You were born in Nebraska, right? reared in Minnesota, and you took the Crow land because you could. And we're going to take your land because we can. Right? Now that also, though, is part of the manifest destiny, but it's not asserting any sort of divine providence or Hegelian providence right, that, uh, or any sort of historical necessity. Instead, all it is saying is, listen, you're bad guys, we're bad guys, we just happen to have the bigger guns, and the way the world works is whoever has the biggest guns wins, and that's us. So deal with it and stop playing the victim card. Now, both of those are part of the legacy of Manifest Destiny, but I don't think either of them is true, nor an exemplar of how we should think about foreign policy, expansionism issues, or even how 
two cultures should interact with each other, particularly if we are libertarians or broadly liberals or classical liberals, right, and so forth. So in the first place, uh, you know, to make the obvious metaphysical point, I don't think anyone accepts it anymore, but it was not inevitable in any sort of religious sense. It wasn't that God had chosen the Americans and uh, that he had his thumbs morally on the scale for, for everything that the Americans did. Nor, even though this is the early 1800s, the biggest name in German philosophy, and that is to say, therefore, in the world, is Hegel, and Hegel does have a somewhat secularized understanding of history working out by necessary providential forces. That you start to see in uh, some segments of American intellectual culture, but that is not operative uh, as well. So I think what we're left with is to say, well, in you know, purely secular understanding of the forces that were operable, what is the likely outcome when we have two or more cultures interacting with each other in the kinds of circumstances that were operative in the 19th century in the United States? And so then we can say, well, we did have a huge immigration push. Right? So on the eastern side of the United States, large numbers of people are coming in, and the west of part of the United States is dramatically underutilized resources, so we can resort to kind of physics metaphors. Right? You've got a, a big bubble of pressure here, and it seems natural then to say it's going to want to expand, and at that point, the easiest expansion would have been to, to the west. At that point, to the north, in what was then British North America, controlled by the British, uh, expansion, of course, was possible. There was lots of room for development there, but politically it's not as feasible given British and American relations. Or we can say to the south, where the, uh, where the Spanish control, or to the southwest where the Mexicans control, it's a different dynamic. And so really the biggest open area, nature abhors a vacuum, is to the west, and that's where the sparsely populated Indians happen to be. Or we can say another real-life secular factor is political. Right? Some politicians have ambitions, and one way to express their ambitions is territorial expansion. So there's nothing special about the Americas at this particular point. Or there are the political needs of the, this new American country. If we don't expand to the West, well, the British will expand to the West, or the Spanish will expand to the West, or the French, even though we purchased Louisiana from them, the French are not completely gone, they will have some aspirations, so maybe as a preemptive political maneuver in order to protect American national interests, it's strategically important for us to move to the West. Then if we switch over to the, uh, the Indian side, we have two very different cultures, right, a European, and I think definitely a more progressive culture than the Indians were at that point. It's not to say that everything the Indians did was bad, but it is important that the Indians were uh, a warrior, hunter, honor culture. And uh, again, there are degrees among the various Indian tribes, so we have to get granular fairly quickly. But from the Indian perspective, the idea that we can work out mutually beneficial deals with these European peoples whom they looked down upon, right? those people are farmers. Right? And what does a farmer look like if your lifestyle is hunter and warrior? Those aren't real men. And they want us to do deals with them, and they want us to assimilate to their culture. No real man can do that. Right? Or they want us to change our attitudes with respect to, uh, to women. Half of them seem to be anti-slavery, and the Indians had no problem with slavery internally. What you did have was a clash not only of military cultures, but also a clash of moral cultures. And on that side, the, I think the Indians were in a worse situation morally, but also a great deal of resistance even to the idea that we can work out mutually beneficial assimilatory relationships. And none of that has anything to do with manifest destiny. And of course, there are the unintended factors like the disease factors and so forth. Uh, so I do want to say, though, do I have a couple more minutes? Or am I out of time? Sure, we'll give the other people some more minutes later. Okay, all right, thanks. Just on this inevitability point, that, uh, that the American expansion to the West uh, might have been desirable uh, from their perspective and, and uh, ultimately civilizational, I think that's absolutely true. But if you notice that the Indians really were a special case and how the Americans dealt with the Indians was quite different from the way they dealt with the British, the way they dealt with the Spanish, the, de the way they dealt with the, the Americans, the way they dealt with the with the, with the French. In some cases, they're doing treaties. And if there's a few wars here and there, but they tend to be relatively small. 
and it's uh, border skirmishes, really, by, uh, even by standards of the time. Uh, or it's outright purchases. You know, we purchased the, the Louisiana Purchase, and we purchased Manhattan, and so forth. So the Indians was a, was a unique case, but there was nothing inevitable about it. I'll stop there. Okay, we'll, we'll even up the time before we get to the questions from the audience. Um, our third panelist was with me last year on a debate from the main stage about Western civilization. John Previs was professor of classics at Eckerd College for 10 years, the beginning of this century, and uh, he's now visiting professor of classics at University of South Florida in Sarasota. His most recent book is Hannibal's Oath in 2017, and along with Steve Forbes, he wrote Power, Ambition, and Glory. It's an excellent book about uh, some of the ancient classical figures uh, such as Hannibal, uh, Alexander, Caesar, and so forth, and their relations to modern figures and analogies of mistakes and successes the ancients made and how they're being replicated today. And he's going to take the side of the uh, progressive, the positive side of Manifest Destiny. John Previs. Good afternoon. G Gary has alluded, and I must make a disclosure to my fellow panelists and to all of you. My area is the ancient world. Persia, Greece, Rome, and Carthage. I don't know much of anything about U.S. history. So you're probably all wondering, as I'm sure my fellow panelists are, then what the hell are you doing up on that panel? Well, let me try and explain to you what got me here. I teach at the University of South Florida, a public university, um, and I got a panic call last, early last spring from the dean who said that a professor of the teaching the section of U.S. history had left unexpectedly and consistent with the mentality of most administrators, we need a warm body in that classroom in two weeks. And of course, you know, administrators tend today to regard professors like myself as spark plugs. You can back us off of one cylinder, put us in another one, and we'll fire consistently because remember, the main thing here is keep that engine running. And so I thought to myself, well, well, I don't know anything about U.S. history. I haven't, I studied U.S. history as an undergraduate, you know, 50 years ago. They, oh, you can do it, John, you can do it. So I thought, well, why not? Why not rise to the challenge? It'd be good for me to reread U.S. history and refresh myself and, and get in there and give it the old, you know, rah, rah, rah. So fine. So I started to put together my lectures um, I was immediately contacted by a number of um, book representatives. You know, oh, you're teaching the section of U.S. history. We want you to use our textbook. I said, well, fine, S send me the textbook. So I got the textbooks immediately, overnight delivery, and I'm looking through the textbooks. And what do I see? Lots of empty pages, tons and tons of pictures, and very little text. I mean, I remember my, the, the textbooks I studied U.S. history from, you know, Samuel Eliot Morrison. I mean, it was 95% text. I'm seeing lots of, and lots of photographs of American Indians. I'm sorry, Native Americans. My brother-in-law is a Native American, and I'm instructed by my wife sitting in the audience to refer not to the Indians, but to the Native Americans. So if I regress, I hope you'll excuse me and she'll forgive me. But I'm looking at these pictures and I'm thinking to myself, all of a sudden, you know, I'm, 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 my mind is always in the ancient world and I'm thinking to myself, immediately comes to my mind, quod scriptura legendibus, hoc pictura idiotibus. And for those of you who have forgotten your Latin, and even worse, for those of you who didn't take Latin, what words are for readers, pictures are for idiots. So, all right, so I accepted the textbook, and I go in there, and I think to myself, now, the first, I'm teaching the second half of U.S. history, so I am teaching um, from the end of Reconstruction to the modern, modern day. And my first unit is the settling of the West. Now, to me, as an undergraduate, even in high school, I mean, I was raised to see the settling of the West as a magnificent thing. I mean, it was a, it was a tremendous undertaking. People walked 2,000 miles 
and then they, they, they began to try and eke out a living in a hostile environment, fighting not only the land, but, but, but fighting the, uh, the hostile Native Americans. And I thought to myself, it's a tremendous undertaking. And now, but when I read the book, the book says, and you know, they send me these little sample lesson plans. It was not a good time, in, a good period in American history. It was a period for which we should all be thoroughly ashamed for our treatment of Native Americans, and we should certainly all vote for Elizabeth, uh, who is going to issue checks to all the descendants of Native Americans in a formal apology so we can make up for our rapacious capitalistic transgressions. So my problem, and I'm, and, and, and I'm not trying to make light of this, but my problem as a professor, how do I go into a classroom and how do I teach this period of history in an objective manner? In that classroom, I've got black faces, I've got red faces, I've got yellow faces, and I've got white faces. Now, how do I teach what happened in the American West? How do I teach my students that history isn't fair, life isn't fair, that there were terrible things done to the Indians? I grant you that, but the Indians did terrible things to the settlers, and it's just sometimes the way history goes. And there is no rational explanation for it. So I try to give them as balanced an approach as I possibly could. And I try to say to them, look at the positive aspect of it, look at the negative aspect, and how do I teach it without exacerbating the tension, the cultural and political tensions and divides that exist in this country, and especially among my students. And that's my problem with it. So, I have um, a question that I'm going to ask Tom because uh, he, he has some time on the, on the clock that he can make up here. I'm going to uh, ask about some passages in his book um, about Red Cloud. And if you don't mind, I might use the term Siberian Americans. <laughs> Everybody comes from somewhere, right? Didn't the Native Americans come over the, the frozen block of the Bering the Sea? And, and come over, and maybe they, if there were people here, they probably conquered them, and, and the tribes may have wiped out some other tribes along the way. So I'm going to ask you, isn't the, um, the culture of the Native or Siberian Americans one of might makes right? And in your book, page 56, you said the Lakota Sioux culture is a Stone Age culture with horses at it. On page 25, you said Red Cloud routinely disemboweled Shoshones and scalped Arikari, Arikara. And on page 8, you referred in general to their torture ethos, which was, to the Western mind, worse than anything they had ever read about. The Anglo-European soldiers and settlers had memories of the Roman Colosseum, the barbarities of the Crusades, and the dungeons of the Inquisition, and they could not fathom the kinds of tortures that were inflicted upon their loved ones. So wasn't there some kind of a justification in the ethos of the Native Americans themselves for the kind of overrunning power of the white man in the West over them? I, I, I think that might be apples and oranges. You know, there was the, the, Indi the Indians had their own culture, like you talk about, and I mentioned before, a very brutal one. Uh, they, they, uh, you succeeded as a tribe by being tougher than the tribes around you because that way you had more access to the better hunting grounds. Uh, you had more protection for your, for your wives and children and raising your children and teaching them to become warriors and hunters. Um, so I don't think because they had a, a brutal culture, one that uh, did things like this. I mean, also mentioned in the book is that there was a belief among uh, the Indians that uh, how you went into the afterworld was, how your body went into the afterworld was how it was when you died. So that's why there were a lot of these mutilations and you would gouge your enemy's eyes out so he couldn't see in the afterworld. Uh, you would, you would take, take an arm of arms off so they couldn't successfully hunt in the afterworld. That was part of their belief system, which of course sounds very brutal and sadistic, uh, but they were following their, their belief system. Um, so I don't think because they had a brutal lifestyle, 
uh, means that it was justified to defeat them, you know, and, and eradicate them. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of apples and oranges. And what I meant before about inevitable is that um, when, when as, as white civilization was moving farther west and there were increasing uh, encounters with the Indians, it was not just the superiority of technology and military that the whites had. Uh, you made a mention before of diseases. Uh, the Indian populations did not have the immunity to the diseases that the Europeans had, were bringing over with them. Uh, smallpox, for example, uh, uh, killed thousands upon thousands of Indians. Uh, there, were, there are cases of 80% of populations of tribes dying because of acquiring diseases they had no immunity to. Alcohol was a factor. Indians did not have the, the ability to be, have any immunity to alcohol. Now, you know, Red Cloud's father, when he was only five years old, we're talking about the mid-1820s, his cause of death was alcoholism in the 1820s. Uh, that, we, that ran rampant through Indian tribes. Um, the other part of inevitability simply has to do with population growth and population reduction. Uh, there's a quote, a very brief one I want to read you that, uh, from Red Cloud, where when he was in Washington and having these you know, tours and, and discussions with officials there, he talked about comparing the two cultures. He said, we are melting like snow on the hillside where you're growing like spring, like, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, excuse me, like spring flowers. Mm. So what he's also saying is there's two things happening at the same time. The white population is not only expanding westward, but expanding in general. There's just every time the Indians turned around, there were more of them showing up, settling, farming, uh, doing these other occupations. At the same time, the Indian population was decreasing because some of it was militarily, but a lot more was because of disease, uh, to a certain extent, there was, there was increasing amounts of intermarriage. So that uh, you, you, have, you have tribes today where you, you very rarely can find you know, a full-blooded Indian, as the expression goes. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but uh, there was a gradual dwindling of that population. So when you have something like that happening, one population growing by leaps and bounds, and another one that's you know, declining and reducing, uh, the, one's going to be a lot more powerful than the other. And it's... Very, there's nothing really the smaller population can do about it. It's, it's a downward curve that can't be stopped. I want to mention that uh, one of the freedom fighters we're honoring here at Freedom Fest with a room is Russell Means, next door at Champagne Rooms. He, I believe he's a Lakota Sioux, and I had the honor to meet him in 1988 when he was running for president of the Libertarian Party. Came down to meet Jim Blanchard, for whom I was working. We took him out to lunch, and, and we had a good time talking with him, and and he also just drank Diet Coke because he has an aversion to alcohol, as so many yeah. Native Americans do. And he was a wonderful person. He fought for freedom, not only for his people, but for the Mosquito Indians down in Nicaragua during that, that fight in the, in the 1980s. Um, you can come up for some questions. I have a question having to do with the so-called end of the frontier in 1890. Uh, of course, men, uh, the bury my heart at wounded knee happened then, but also the reputed end of the frontier in America. But then did America overextend its manifest destiny by annexing Hawaii out in the middle of the Pacific and, and then going even further to invade the Philippines and uh, taking over Guam and American Samoa, not to mention Alaska, which seemed to me a bit of Canada's manifest destiny, if you look at a map. Uh, did we overextend our manifest destiny? Any one of our panelists want to handle that one? Gary, oh. can I make just sure. one make. brief point just to, to reinforce what Thomas said? I think we have to look... At the, at the 19th century, it was an intensely religious period. People, Americans moving west, were very religious, motivated by religion. If you look at Christianity, they feel, felt probably that they had an obligation to bring not only the benefits of, of civilization to the heathens, but also to save their souls from, from, from damnation. So I think that we also have that as, aspect of it. Uh, and then it's, it's what, what you're pointing out now, going into the next stage from Manifest Destiny, we get into what Rudyard Kipling called white man's burden. And that becomes, that comes to the surface. It's, a, it, it, it's certainly a variation of Manifest Destiny, and that will happen about 1890, Kipling, his, his famous poem about the white man's burden, which he wrote 
uh, as a way of trying to support the American uh, expansion, uh, the American taking of Guam, the American taking of Puerto Rico, uh, and of course our stewardship of Cuba and our taking of the Philippines. Yeah. Seems we've got big eyes after we've finished our manifest destiny. Yeah, just to piggyback and second part of what uh, Tom and John are saying, uh, I think it's important, that since a lot of the debate here is about the morality of the interactions here, to make an assessment of the morality of Indian culture. And while I think we can all say there are some admirable elements, overall it was a brutal culture, uh, you know, uh, not to use too much anachronistic language, right? but they had no problem with racism, they had no problem with sexism, they had no problem with brutality, very limited understandings of, uh, of property rights, uh, no sense of humane treatment of prisoners, right, and so forth. So the fact that they then uh, 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 were on the losing end of a battle, right, it does follow that it's disingenuous for them or for their apologists, the ones John is worried about now, to then play the victim card and to see them uh, on their behalf, right, as victims, as losers, as on the, on the receiving end. But it is, and this is your point, a separate question then to say, what is our moral assessment of the European Americans and how they treated the Indians? It's not the case that since the Indians were bad people and did bad things, we can do bad things, right, to them. It's an assessment, how should we, what standard are we going to set for ourselves when we're dealing with other people, in some cases, right, people who are militarily weaker than us, and then when we're dealing with others who are of lower uh, uh, moral civilizational development in certain respects, uh, at what point is it bad enough that we can do various things in self-defense or proactively? And those are open questions. Okay, first question from the audience. Uh, Let's see, is this on? Yes, it is. First of all, what a wonderful discussion. I agree with all the points. It's very logical. And, you know, just really nice, calm analysis. The, the part I think you have missed, you didn't start early enough. So King Philip's War in 1675 is the bloodiest war in American history per capita. Twice the Civil War. And there's a good book on the Mayflower in uh, 2007. And uh, I'll look it up in a minute. But the, the point there in that war is the Indians, King Philip was the son of Massawat, where we get Massachusetts. So this is when the Indians decided, because of the incredible increase in the population of the whites, they had to do something. And it's a not just Indian versus white, but it's an interaction between Indian tribes and divide and conquer. And, but in any case, the Indians lost. And, the, and as a result, I think that's why it's logical, just from a probability point of view, the increase in population, that by the time we get to the 19th century, the whites are going to go sea to shining sea. Any comment up here? Uh, yeah, I like the, the flavor of much of that. Another element of this is that I think it's, uh, it's a, one of a wrong label to use whites right, versus labor. And I think a lot of that permeates contemporary discussions because contemporary academics are intensely, I don't know, they might be the most recent uh, obsessed people in the world. Right? Uh, but I don't think this was like a, a whites versus reds issue, right? even at the time. Uh, the, the Indians, by and large, did not see themselves as a unified culture. They were still largely tribal. And I think there was more of a European consciousness right, among the Europeans, but even then, it was still a much more nationalistically oriented. Right? It's the French, it's the British. And so the ethnic labels have to come to the fore, I think, much more quickly. So just as the English and the Spanish their histories in the United States were very different. I mean, uh, J. H. Eliot, uh, his line was to say, essentially, and this is a high-level abstraction, the English were a, an empire of commerce, and the Spanish were an empire of conquest. So even among these two European nations, you have two very different moral cultures and two very different foreign policy cultures. And to some extent, to a lesser degree, that is mirrored in the various 
uh, uh, Indian Native American tribes as well. So the, the Iroquois and the Apache and the, the Squamish and so forth, very different at certain levels of abstraction as well. So I really think the ethnicity label is more important than the race label at this point. You know, I've, I've always believed that, you know, what is history but a chronicle of man's senseless cruelty toward his fellow man? And you think we treat the Indians badly? Look at the way we treat each other. And I just say to my students, I can begin, I can take you back to ancient Persia, I can take you back to Egypt and move you through history. And it's just, I, I, I don't, you know, you can't explain it sometimes. And, and yet overriding wonder, it is so much progress, too. That's the other side of the same story. And so that's, it, it's a chronicle, a chronicle of senseless cruelty of man toward his fellow man. Next question. I had uh, two examples I wanted to share with you. You probably know about it. This gentleman uh, hit on it right here. So in Massachusetts, the Wampanoag Indians, 90% of them wiped off by smallpox, befriended the pilgrims. Why? Because they hated the Narragansetts, and they looked at these white guys as, sa as saviors as they fought over, over Narragansett Bay. And then in 1675... Basically, the Wampanoags had said, you know, King Philip, the son of uh, Massasoit, said, screw it, you know, there's nothing to be gained by the English. We'll align with the Narragansetts and the Pequot. Ten percent of the population died, and a bunch of my relatives were there with it. Now, you fast forward to Billings, where I lived 40 years ago, teaching at Montana State, and I learned about the Crow. And they basically aligned, what, with the whites, saying, we don't want to be overrun by the Cheyenne that came into our territory, the Sioux that came out of Minnesota. And they, in turn, were rewarded, right, with a reservation that was always three times the size of lame deer. But we saw it shrink over time. So it wasn't totally taken away, but both of them shrunk down. So to me, it's intriguing from a business standpoint, a cultural, how alliances are formed and broken. I think in the Indian history, there's probably more fluid alliances than there are in Survivor that we watch on TV every Wednesday night. So is this a subject that's been studied academically? I haven't read it in much detail, but it seems to be out there as, as overlooked. Am I just more interested in a subject that nobody has an interest in? Tom, you made that point in your book when they tried to bring the leaders of the, of the uh, tribes together, and they said, what do you mean leaders? Remember that part? Yeah, there was a part, well, the, the, the term chief was something that was more of a white uh, a creation because they didn't, recognize their leaders as, as chiefs. But uh, yes, it's a very good point that Indian tribes were always forming and reforming alliances. Uh, and, and this goes throughout you know, the, the history that, that we know about. You know, even during the colonial times, you had, the, uh, you had the French and Indian War, and the Indians were sort of in between. They had alliances with the French. Okay, well, the English started to win a couple of battles there. Let's align with the English. And uh, so, the, you know, the, the, the Indians had leaders who were uh, uh, sometimes uh, also had the role of diplomats. They had to form these alliances with others. They had, you know, thinking about the, not just the survival of it, but who's in their best interests. You know, if so-and-so wins, is that best for us? Okay, then let's, let's align with them. And then, yes, as you go farther west, you had tribes that aligned with each other at different times because of mercenary uh, survival, mercenary uh, hunting grounds, they were o always doing that. So uh, what it seems like it was very difficult for them to do at any particular time was have a multi-tribal multi alliance that actually would have represented a significant, powerful military force that could have stopped, st stopped or at least uh, maybe fought to a standstill the, the progress that was coming west. And that's mostly because they were would, they would, too, too angry with each other you know, to form these long-lasting alliance of any kind. One last comment. Isn't the Indian chief basically one of the most democratic leaders there are? Like pirates, they were elected, and they had to be supported by the majority. If they weren't, they were... If they weren't doing a good job, no support, you're out. <laughs> I know. I know. You don't wait four years for the next election. Right. You know, we don't like what you're doing, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sir? Hello. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the discussion that you've uh, brought today. Um, I had one question on the point of inevitability, um, and I was wondering if you could speak to uh, this. It seems to me that there were uh, different episodes in this process of, of manifest destiny, and it seems that prior to the Civil War, 
uh, the Manifest Destiny seemed to be more organic, where it was usually the government trying to catch up to the settlers. Uh, I mean, even Andrew Jackson's removal of the Indians across the Mississippi is, is in a response to people who were much more aggressive, wanted to do, go much further down in, in the southern states. So it, it seems, though, that after the Civil War, once the U.S. had a standing army, really, for the first time, they started being much more out in front of the people and clearing the Indians out, inviting, and then having policies to invite people out west. And uh, it, rather than proceeding organically, you had a lot of people coming out mm -hmm. west who the, the resources weren't there to farm on the plains. They really, the, the, the plains seemed to be better suited to the, the Indians, to fit them better. So I was just wondering if you could comment on the inevitability question. Um, could we say that maybe it wasn't I inevitable, uh, that maybe a certain part of it was, the, the there was a natural growth maybe prior to the Civil War, but when it came to conquering the West, you needed a lot more of the federal government in terms of troops, in terms of financial incentives, free land, and a lot of subsidizing to make it happen. And maybe that could have been the turning point. I would appreciate your comments on that. Thanks. Yeah, along the same lines of inevitability, what if gold had not been discovered? No major gold or silver in the West. Would they just keep dribbling West and not, not a huge phalanx coming West? I mean, that ties in with his inevitability question. Anyone comment on that? Uh, <clears throat> well, my view is that none of these things are inevitable. It always requires decisions at, uh, at each stage. So uh, it wasn't inevitable that Napoleon was going to sell Louisiana Purchase. Right? It wasn't inevitable that the Oregon uh, resolution with the British North Americans was going to be decided at the 49th parallel. Uh, how Maine became part of the United States. It requires judgments at the, at the point. Uh, but my point just would be what we seem to learn as a lesson from American history is generally a positive lesson that the, the, uh, the Americans seem to have a priority of values. When we come here, primarily we're coming to be productive. We want to farm. We want to trade. And that's, our, that's our top value. And uh, if we can't farm and trade in our disputed territories, we're willing to try to work out treaties with various organizations. That's going to be our, our next step. If necessary, we will go to war. But it always was a, an if necessary thing. And that then is, I think, a sign of progress. So in the sense uh, of arguing that manifest destiny, if we loosen that term up a lot, was progressive, that's fine. Because for the first time in history, you do have a culture that has a roughly properly ordered value hierarchy. Right? Produce and trade, treaties, war as a last resort. But the problem, of course, that we run into with, uh, with some of the other cultures, particularly the Native Americans, is that they had an inverted value hierarchy. Right? Making war was always the top value. That's the most manly thing that you can do. Treaties, if necessary, and then being productive and trading is, is a, a last resort. And that's just going to set you up for nasty clashes. Take a little bit of a different viewpoint. I, I think that history produces vacuums, and those vacuums are filled by the strongest at the time, and that determines, unfortunately, sometimes the direction that history moves in. Final question. Okay. Uh, on Wednesday, I think it was the I call them the Montana School, Pete J. Hill and uh, Terry Anderson. They kind of poo pooed. You know, they blamed the army for the bad things that happened to the Indians, mm. or the Native Americans, whatever they are, in the, in the West. And I just wonder, had, had we applied to obtaining land from the Sioux the way, you know, I obtained land from the Birminghams, who were the people I bought the land from. Could it have worked out? Like they discover oil, not oil. What was it? What did they discover? Gold, gold in the Black Hills, and the previous was it not the previous uh, deal was that the the Sioux owned the Black Hills. Well, had there been more of a property rights or a market system, could we have bought off the Sioux 
knew that goal. If there was enough of it, I'm sure you could have. Maybe I'm Senate. <clears throat> there, there was a treaty in 1868 which, uh, which ended Red Cloud's war, which the federal government acknowledged Sioux ownership, if you would, uh, of the Black Hills. And uh, that, and the uh, the government was supposed to enforce no intrusion to the Black Hills by white European, you know, soldiers, settlers, whatever. Uh, but once gold was discovered, only six years later, you know, that that treaty went out the window. So, uh, you know, just just uh, one thing Red Cloud said is, uh, he said, the, you know, the white people made me a lot of promises, and they only kept one. They promised to take my land, and they took it. So that was, that was him acknowledging that, uh, you know, treaties were, even with the best intentions, usually were, uh, not, did not last that long. Not just in the 1860s, but we're going back to when they were, the Fort Stanwix Treaty in 1768, and the, the Treaty of, of uh, 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 you know, hard, hard labor, and, and also with the Cherokee in 1768. So, you know, there were, there were legitimate attempts to purchase you know, land from Indian tribes. Uh, but they just, uh, uh, once, once, you know, once that land was settled upon and there was no longer any kind of dispute over it, then we started to covet what was next. So, so, so as soon as Wild Bill and the gold, the gold diggers got to uh, the Black Hills, the government, <clears throat> government abandons yeah. its duty to protect the property rights. Yeah, and just as a very quick footnote, um, it, it, decades later, the Indians filed a lawsuit, which went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which decided in the 1940s that there was should be a compensation, monetary compensation, to the Lakota Sioux for the taking of the Black Hills, and money was put in the U.S. Treasury to compensate them. The Indians since then have refused to accept that money with interest. That money still sits there in the U.S. Treasury. It's over a billion dollars. I, I always thought I Okay, one other. We, we do have to close. Uh, the, a, new, a new group's coming in here. It's, it's two minutes after three. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, they're taking over our territory. It's historical. Oh, can I buy it? Yeah, you can buy it from. Buy the time from them. Um, I'm not going to take the closing poll, but did we change anybody's mind today? Did we change you from one side to the other? Anybody want to raise their hand? We didn't, but we informed you, and that's all our main purpose was. Thank our panel. The one thing, kind of, maybe you touch on it, 